so first off, I just want to give a brief introduction. Uh, thanks for being here, everybody, and thanks for joining us for our uh, Secular AZ speaker series today. We are a nonprofit organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state for over a decade. Um, this week, we're going to be discussing the midterm 2022 election outcomes and what comes next for the 2023 legislative session and how you can advocate at every le level for secular government. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm usually the facilitator of these things, uh, but my name is Jeannie Castine and I've been the executive director for Secular AZ for just over a year. A um, <clears throat> little bit of background about myself and my own religiosity or lack thereof. Uh, both of my parents were raised kind of religious. My mom actually attended Catholic school. She has stories about how mean the nuns were. Um, but by the time I came around, because I'm the baby of the family, uh, they had both stopped attending church. Thank goodness. I dabbled in Unitarian Universalism briefly in my 20s, but have identified as an atheist or humanist for most of my life. Uh, I have a background in public education. And with that background, I quickly realized that Arizona is kind of ground zero for blurring the lines between public and private education. I served on the Creighton School Board for eight years. And in 2019, I won the All Arizona School Board Member Award. Uh, I ran for Maricopa County School Superintendent in 2020. And most recently, I ran for the State Senate in Arizona's Legislative District 2 here in North Phoenix. Um, last year, as the designated lobbyist for Secular AZ, I tracked dozens of bills that prioritized state-sanctioned religious discrimination over solving problems that everyday Arizonans faced. And unfortunately, this session, I kind of imagine that we're going to see more of the same. So after today's presentation, I hope that you become motivated to do whatever you can to combat religious extremism in your own communities. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to take a minute here to share my screen, make sure I have the right screen up. Give me one second. Normally other people do this and I know how to do it. I'm just a little bit slow at it. So let's get there. There we go. All right. Turn this into a slideshow. Back, 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 back. All right. So now what? I know that a lot of our members have been very active in the 2022 midterms. Many of you are probably uh, precinct committee people, oops, sorry about that, in your own uh, legislative districts and uh, that you're engaged at your school board level and that you probably even attend maybe your county board of supervisor meetings and things like that. And now we've seen some good happen and I'm going to go over that real quickly. So let's start off with the good. Why not? Uh, yesterday was the inauguration ceremony for, um, you know, the various statewide um, people who got elected into office. Uh, we've got some great outcomes. We have uh, Katie Hobbs as the governor of Arizona. Uh, we have Adrian Fontes as our new secretary of state. Uh, Chris Mays, I'm sorry I didn't include a picture of her in this, but I hear that she gave a really fiery and wonderful speech yesterday at the inauguration ceremony. Mark Kelly retained his uh, Senate seats and um, Prop 308 passed. We even had some winners in these smaller races like the uh, Central Arizona Project where we're seeing people who truly care about water conservation and the environment sitting on those boards. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't see the same outcomes in the Corporation Commission races. But let's, let's focus on the good for right now because we get enough of the bad and the extreme on a regular basis. So a few things, and I'm gonna take a look at my notes here, uh, but there were some propositions that were passed, specifically 128. Uh, 128 would have allowed the legislature to undo ballot initiatives. Um, so that one uh, did not, uh, it, it did not pass, sorry. And uh, 209, predatory debt collection. That was the healthcare rising bill. Um, that one passed as well. So congratulations for that. Uh, 211 is the dirty money out of politics. This is one that I think that we've been trying to get on the ballot now for perhaps since 2018 or maybe even 2016. Um, and that one passed. And for me, something that's near and dear to my heart is Prop 308, which allows for in-state tuition for dreamers. I've had countless students over the years 
who felt that they couldn't move on to higher education because it was cost prohibitive. And so um, seeing that pass is a victory for everybody. It's good for Arizona, it's good for the economy, and it's good for these students and their families. Um, <clears throat> Prop 309, this is another victory, uh, was rejected. And that's the voter ID measure. So um, that's a, a real victory for Arizona. And I do, if you could maybe put it in the chat to Vix Picks, uh, Lindsay. So we had a, a local attorney who uh, kind of gave a presentation, I would say back in October or November about how he uh, chose the people that he chose with regards to who should be um, retained on the courts and who should be rejected in the courts. And we had three county judges that were sent packing, specifically Rusty Crandall, Stephen Hopkins, and Howard Sukenik, not retained. This is virtually unheard of in Arizona. And I would like to give props to people like Vic, Aranow, I think is his last name, as well as Civic Engagement Beyond Voting, because they uh, ran a very focused campaign to break down what these judges uh, have done their professionalism or lack thereof, their discriminatory practices within the courtroom, et cetera. Um, and so I'm, I'm very grateful for those groups who do that kind of work and who you know, give advice to those of us who are completely overwhelmed by that page, that very long page of judges and to know whether they should be retained or not retained. Um, another piece of good news here in Maricopa County is that every override continuation at the school board level, at the school district level, passed. And that's continuation, and I'll get to the difference between that and regular overrides and bonds here in just a minute. Um, so another thing that I'd like to point out, you know, there were five targeted districts, legislatively speaking, here in Arizona, uh, that uh, we really hoped that we could either retain seats or push the needle. And so uh, there was a lot of focus on districts two, four, nine, uh, 13, and 16. And we had, um, you know, a mixed bag there, but at least, at the very least, we maintained the number of seats that we have in the state legislature, despite the fact that there seemed to be an attempt to kind of gerrymander those districts and box certain candidates out. So congratulations to the team in LD9. Um, you know, as some of you might recall, there was a candidate there who had uh, various pictures of herself dressed in blackface. She was defeated by these more progressive candidates. Um, Christine Porter Marsh uh, retained her seat, Laura Tarek up in LD4, another teacher. And I think we might have more teachers in our state legislature now than we ever had in the history of Arizona. And as a teacher myself, a former teacher, it is because we are very much motivated by what we see coming out of the Capitol and the type of legislation that comes up year after year after year that seems to target our public schools, our, our school boards, our teachers, our students, and our families. Um, I'd like to point out that there are a couple districts outside of those five targeted districts, uh, specifically LD17 in the Tucson area, and LD27 just to the west of me in the Glendale area. Uh, as some of you might recall, uh, there weren't candidates in LD27. And before the primary, we had two candidates step up and uh, put themselves forward as write-in candidates. They made it on the ballot. And you know, while they did not win, it was an incredibly impressive showing of, of what they were able to accomplish and how they were able to move the needle and so I hope that folks that live in those districts are considering the possibility of running and running on a secular agenda that is more inclusive than exclusive and that's focused on solving real problems instead of trying to solve problems that don't really exist. Um, so some not so good, right? There were some congressional races that were lost and <laughs> If any of you are watching the latest C-SPAN series, um, you know, those voices that we lost are incredibly important. Um, uh, Jevin Hodge, unfortunately, lost his race. So Halloran, Engel lost their races. And so as we've seen, 
this past week, the majority is now, and, and I don't really focus so much on what's happening in Congress. I'm very much more focused on what happens at my local school board, my municipality and my legislature. But as we've seen, this is just going to contribute to the gridlock that already kind of has strangled uh, Washington, D.C. And, and any kind of you know, policies that, that are progressive that come out of there. We don't even, we can't even start working on things because of the infighting with the Republican Party. All I can hope, I guess, is that we can see that, you know, put on display. Others will see that these folks really aren't working for them, but they're working for their own self-serving agendas. Um, came close with uh, regards to Bill, Go Bill Montgomery, who's a Supreme Court justice here in Arizona. Um, in Maricopa County, he overwhelmingly lost and would have not been retained. So congratulations again to Civic Engagement Beyond Voting for being able to move the needle the way that you all have. And now, you know, we just need to take that message to every other county in Arizona. And I know that we have members who are very passionate about these kinds of things in the north, in the, in the south, in the rural parts of Arizona. And so I hope that you all will um, get on board. And I'll share a link later on about CEBV and the work that they do. <clears throat> Julie Gunnigal, despite setting the record for gathering signatures once, um, you know, there was a vacancy in the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, I think she gathered signatures in less than 24 hours, which is essentially unheard of. Uh, she did not win her race. Uh, Senator Martin Quesada, who is quite possibly my favorite uh, politician. I say this all the time. I'm, I'm a major fangirl and he's a good friend of mine, but he's a very rational, reasonable voice at the Capitol. He'll be missed. Um, and I think that the people of Arizona missed a real opportunity to have a champion who would understand how uh, best to spend the money of the taxpayers in Arizona and how best to invest that money. So can't wait to see what Senator Quesada does next. Um, and I look forward to it, whatever it is. Um, there were a few other bills that were passed, Props 129, which complicates the ballot initiative process and makes the challenges easier. Uh, that one passed 131. This is the creation of a Lieutenant Governor position um, that I, again, this is coming from the party who, this came out of the legislative session. This is coming from the party who believes in small government, but we are now creating an entirely new office uh, for the Lieutenant Governorship. And then 132 is quite possibly one of the biggest disappointments for the ballot measures. Uh, this one requires a 60% approval for, ba for ballot initiatives that raise taxes. So the voters of Arizona essentially made it more difficult for the voters of Arizona to pass ballot initiatives. And it's already incredibly difficult to do that in the first place. So that was a big disappointment. I mentioned earlier that the corporation commission candidates, the ones who truly care about the environment and about making sure that these corporations can't just kind of wreak havoc on the environment, both lost their races, including Sandra uh, or Sandra Kennedy, who was an incumbent. Um, check my notes here real quick and make sure. Uh, yep. Okay. Let me move on to the next one. Um, so yeah, I mentioned earlier that the uh, continuations of some of these um, budget overrides all passed. What that means is that these districts had. Um, uh, an override in place already, and they last a certain number of years. And so as you, as the years kind of go by and that money is going to run out, school districts will go back to the voters and say to them, hey, uh, you know, this is just a continuation. It's not going to raise your taxes. Y'all are already paying this override. It shows up in your property taxes. Um, we're asking you to continue that funding. So districts that tend to be more in the middle of Maricopa County, um, they were able to keep those overrides in place. Uh, unfortunately, the burden does fall on the taxpayer, but that is because the state of Arizona over the years has cut capital funding. There is a lawsuit currently happening that's been going on, I think, for the last five years 
from these districts to get their fair funding. And depending on who you talk to, we are talking about anywhere between about a billion and four billion dollars based on inflation that districts have been shorted. Um, when I worked in a school district in Maryvale, um, we really struggled and buildings were literally crumbling around my students' ears. You know, we would have buckets and garbage cans to collect rainwater during the monsoon season. Um, you know, there were uh, some, some of the classrooms still had chalkboards and not even whiteboards. I mean, things like that, overhead projectors instead of document cameras. And so we, you know, or air conditioners that just don't work. Um, so, so I just read something today about Chris Mays, who is our newly elected um, uh, attorney general in the state of Arizona. And she is going to be taking a look at that lawsuit. So fingers crossed, having uh, an attorney general who is really focused on the law and, and what's right for the people of Arizona will allow for that lawsuit to finally start moving and to see some of these schools get the funding that they deserve and that's guaranteed to them in the Constitution of Arizona. Uh, some bond measures that did get rejected, and you'll see that these are districts that tend to be further away from the center of Maricopa County. You know, the, the, the more central you are in Maricopa County, the bluer you tend to be. And as we move out uh, into the outskirts and the suburbs, that's where we see purple, fuchsia, pink, <laughs> and, and very red districts. So Agua Fria, Fountain Hills, Higley, Natterberg, Queen Creek, those bond measures in Maricopa County were rejected. And again, the difference between an override for capital or maintenance and operations is different than a bond measure because bond measures will allow for schools to actually build new buildings. And especially in these places where the population is just blowing up, uh, those bond measures become really important. Now, an interesting thing that I see a parallel here is that for many of these bond measures uh, and budget increases that have been rejected, and the budget increases include Cave Creek and Fountain Hills, these are folks who, when you look at the numbers, actually are um, taking advantage of the uh, private vouchers. When you break it down, so the, the, the voucher measure passed, of course, this past uh, legislative session, it will allow for the most um, extreme expansion of vouchers pretty much anywhere in the whole United States. And make no mistake, people are watching Arizona as kind of a blueprint for how to fully privatize public education. Um, so these vouchers are not being used by the students that I used to teach in Maryville um, or, or students in South Phoenix. These vouchers are being used by wealthy families who already have their kids in private schools, and they tend to happen in the wealthiest districts. So this you know, bill of goods was sold to everybody as an expansion for those poor families, those families living in poverty, to be able to you know, um, move their kids out of their public schools, their neighborhood schools, so that they can go to a private school. That's not what's happening. And forget about it if you're in a rural district. Uh, what it means is that the wealthiest families in Arizona can take about $7,000 per kid from the public schools and use that as essentially a taxpayer subsidized down payment for the private education that they were already planning on providing for their own children. Uh, it's a huge grift and it's going to cause hundreds of millions of dollars to be removed from our already struggling public school system. And, um, and this is by design. Uh, like I said, we are ground zero. And this is something that people have been very methodical about trying to truly destroy our public school system. Thankfully, our teachers in Arizona are some of the most amazing people I've ever worked with. They're resilient, but they are tired, as are their the progressive folks who work on the school boards. And I'll get to how we can support all of them here in just a minute. Um, I wanna take a moment here and just see if I have any questions in the chat. 
Okay, good. Civic engagement beyond voting. Okay, good. Don't see anything there. So let me go ahead and keep moving on. All right, so we've got the good, we've got the bad, and we've got the extreme. <clears throat> um, we have insurrectionists, literal insurrectionists who are in elected offices from school board all the way up to Congress. And we've seen some of those folks this week on uh, the new C-SPAN program. <laughs> Um, uh, as you can see there in the middle, uh, Anthony Kern in LD27, which represents Glendale and Peoria, he's literally at the Capitol on January 6, two years ago today, uh, participating in an insurrection. He also, I believe, was a police officer in, I want to say, Apache Junction, and there were various um, um, things that happened while he was there. Uh, that that he did not behave properly, and I don't think that he even was uh, resigned. I think he was asked to resign. Um, so he's now representing the good people in Glendale and Peoria. We have Kwang Nguyen in LD1, who proudly admits on his Twitter feed that he is an oath keeper. Do not ever forget it. Now what? Um, we also have over on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, Andy Biggs and Wendy Rogers. Um, down at the bottom, there's Jake Hoffman, fake elector Jake Hoffman. And then to the bottom right, we've got Gosar, who finally did, by the way, fold and ended up voting for Kevin McCarthy. Um, so the party of McCain's GOP is long gone. You know, we heard Carrie Lake say something to the effect of driving the heart, driving a stake through the heart of uh, McCain country. And while a lot of voters were offended by that rhetoric and she lost her race, many of those voters while voting against uh, Carrie Lake did not do the same when it came to legislative races. So it's pretty clear that folks don't really see how these legislative races are the ones that affect their lives most directly. And so I hope that we can come up with a plan to start educating folks who seem to think that, you know, the party, that McCain's GOP is still the norm because it really is not. It's now the uh, exception. Um, Let's see, I wanted to touch upon, uh, let's see, something about, let me get to that, I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, so we have also some extreme, extremist school board candidates that were elected at, uh, and, I, and I really mostly paid attention here to Maricopa County just because their county website is a little bit easier to maneuver and track. Um, but we did have some candidates elected in Deer Valley Unified School District. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Paul Carver, who is part of the three percenters. And the three percenter movement is akin to the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys. Um, he was actually mentioned uh, in some of the depositions for the January 6th commission. He had reached out to some of the insurrectionists. He was there in D.C., we know for sure, on January 5th. And he's now going to be making decisions for the children, teachers, and families in the Deer Valley Unified School District. Uh, congratulations, however, to uh, Stephanie Simichek, who also won her race um, in Deer Valley. She is a parent in that district. And so thankfully, we're able to balance it out in Paradise Valley Unified School District. We had two progressive, sensible candidates, Carrie Baker and Tony Pantera who made it onto the board, but the moderate Republican, Susan Matura, lost her bid. And so again, we're seeing a rejection from this extremist GOP to you know, the moderate Republicans in favor of some of these more extremist candidates. Um, in Scottsdale Unified School District, sadly, we saw two more extremists who were endorsed by the Purple for Parents people who, you know, probably got some help from some of these more extremist nonpartisan organizations like Turning Point USA or Moms for Liberty, et cetera. Um, so both candidates and Scottsdale Unified unfortunately lost their bid, both pro-public education candidates. Um, and then in Peoria Unified, 
identified. Again, a mixed bag. Uh, one extremist made it on, one progressive made it on. And the reason why I bring all of this up is because those school board candidates need our support. I talked to, I've talked to many school board candidates over the years and specifically during this legislative cycle. And for those who decided not to run again, who didn't want to return, part of their reasoning was because they, they felt like they got a lot of support getting elected, but they didn't feel like they got enough support once they made it onto the dais. So it really is our responsibility, whether we have children in the school district or not, uh, to support these candidates. And one of the things that we're gonna be doing here in set with Secular AZ over the next couple of years, as we've done this past year with our candidate forums and everything else, is to really support these candidates. And I'm asking for each and every one of you who's watching this, whether you're doing it now on the webinar, whether you're watching me on Facebook, or whether you watch this at a, at a future date on our YouTube channel, I'm asking all of you to really pay attention to your local school districts and find out what's on the agenda. Uh, find out what these folks are going to be voting on. I got word from somebody in Peoria Unified that there's going to be a discussion coming up about kids being able to use the bathrooms that identify with their, or that match their gender identity. As a school board member in the Creighton School District, I'm really proud to say that we passed a resolution, a policy that allows for kids to use the bathroom of their gender identity, that matches their gender identity. And I'll tell you what, that vote, we expected it to be a 4-1 vote. Uh, there's usually five people on school boards. And we had one uh, school board member who, um, was a religious man. He was he, he was a good man. Uh, you know, he headed up a church, and and he actually housed some of the migrants that were coming over the border, um, and and made sure that they had food and clothes, and were able to get in touch with their sponsors. But he he had a, a different opinion when it came to the issues that that affect our LGBTQ youth. And I will tell you what, the meeting where we had the discussion about bathrooms, we had probably a half a dozen people show up. And, and give public comments at that board meeting, sharing their own experiences with discrimination while they were in school, sharing statistics about what happens with kids who do identify as LGBTQ, and especially the really grim outcomes sometimes that exist for our trans kids. And after hearing those uh, public comments, this particular board member changed his mind. And we had a unanimous vote to allow kids to be able to use the restroom that they identify with. And so your voice really does matter. Now, it may not matter quite as much at the Capitol, as many of you who have gone there have seen, we might have 300 people speaking against a bill and five lobbyists speaking for a bill. And it seems that those committees already have their minds made up. But at the school board level, it's harder to avoid that kind of engagement. And so figure out what your school district is, go to their website, look for their future agenda items. And if it's something that is important to you, if it's a secular issue that we need to be aware of, please let us know. Um, I don't know, Lindsay, if you can share the link that I gave you earlier today from um, Civic Engagement Beyond Voting but they are going to be having their first meeting of the new year this Sunday. Uh, and they also have a great training on how to use the request to speak uh, program for the legislature. We are also going to be working on putting together some training modules for those of you who want to get more involved at the school board level so that you know and feel comfortable how to take a look at the agenda, know what to look for, how to address the board, um, how to submit uh, an email so that you know your voice can be heard and that you can speak on behalf of uh, secular government in our public schools. Just going to take a look at the chat, make sure I'm not missing anything. Excellent. Okay. All right. So there's more extreme. Um, Probably one of the biggest disappointments at the state level, uh, at least for me as an educator, was the loss of Kathy Hoffman and her race. Um, makes me wonder, you know, I, I, I driving around my neighborhood, I saw 
a lot of uh, Tom Horn signs and all it said was stop CRT. That seemed to be the extent of his platform, even though we all know that CRT is a collegiate level program. Um, this is the buzzword for folks on the right. The And so uh, Carrie Baker, again, she was recently just elected to the Paradise Valley School Board, was at the inauguration yesterday, and she tweeted this out this morning, Tom Horn rationalized teaching to the test, parent rights, and bringing back real discipline. He didn't once mention anything our schools are currently facing, equity issues, budget issues, staff shortages, nor did he mention student needs. And so we're gonna be getting an awful lot of that. He also said um, in a piece in the Arizona Republic earlier, well, last year, last month, about how he wants to put SROs in every school. Uh, an SRO has never saved anybody in a school shooting, just so you all know. Um, and, uh, but that's, that's what he values, standardized test scores. Again, when I was on the school board in the Creighton School District, we actually passed a resolution that said that we don't put much stock in those standardized test scores. Uh, if you take a, do a deep dive on standardized testing, it's rooted in uh, white supremacy and these tests are often uh, discriminatory in nature and have all kinds of racial bias. So standardized test scores are not truly a good measure of what our kids know and what they're learning. Um, now, if we're gonna use them, we should use them as a flashlight and not as a hammer. But it seems the folks on the right want to use it as a hammer so that they can justify shutting down our public schools. Because if they can just point to the fact that test scores are low, then they can say private schools are gonna be the ones to solve everything, but that's not the case at all. Um, he seems to wanna to target vulnerable students. I've heard from folks who uh, either work at the uh, Department of Education or have friends who did, they've all basically left. He's made some questionable staff appointments um, recently in the last couple of days, I think it was yesterday, excuse me, there was um, a piece by Channel 12 News about this guy, Myla, oh gosh, I'm not gonna be able to get his name right. I think it's Myla Mikan. Um, and he, is, or Mila Mikan, I don't know if, I, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, and he is going to be heading up the Department of Student Wellbeing or something like that, or character, that's what it is, character development. And this guy has a track record on social media of, um, putting up things that are really um, misogynistic in nature, racist in nature. And, and, you know, earlier in his campaign, he utilized David Stringer, who's a convicted pedophile, to help on his campaign. So the choices that uh, the new um, superintendent of public instruction is making are very questionable and should have all of us concerned. And especially at a time where people are throwing around words like rumors and indoctrinators, et cetera, et cetera, to describe teachers or, or people who just wanna teach an accurate history or who want to honor children and, and, and their pronouns and, sh and show them that they are a caring adult. So interesting choice for a superintendent. And just to give you an example of the extremism on the far right, uh, many of you may remember uh, last year that this guy, Randy Kaufman, who was running for the Maricopa County Community College School Board, was caught uh, relieving stress on one of the Maricopa County uh, campuses. So I'm just going to go ahead and put up this video real quick. GOP candidate was pleasuring himself outside of a preschool and was caught doing so and tried to explain to the police what had happened was. Randy Jean Kaufman, avid Trump supporter and GOP candidate for a seat on the Maricopa County Community College District Governing Board, may face felony charges after police caught him in the act of masturbating across the street from an Arizona preschool. What particularly seemed to disturb the office was the proximity, obviously, to young children who were passing by this car. Okay? They need to lock his ass up. The ADL Center on Extremism has been tracking extremists. So we've never seen a moment like this. Over a hundred candidates mm -hmm. running for office who have explicit extremist ties to groups like the Oath Keepers, Proud Boys, the Three Percenters, XKK. That, by the way, is Paul Carver, 
He is the gentleman that I talked about earlier who it just made it onto the Deer Valley Unified School Board. Okay, ex-neo-Nazi. And they're running for Congress, for state office. They're running for Secretary of State so that they can influence the ability of elections. Good evening, everybody. My name is Paul Carter. I'm from the Deer Valley School Board. I searched out the Three Percenters. They're known as a paramilitary organization. I was named as the agent for the Three Percenters here in the state of Arizona. During my time in, I tried to teach people how to be community activists, how to get involved in their local precincts and their legislative districts, participate in their school board meetings. Now there's this big push with this concept of children having equal rights as adults, right, right. I want to make sure that I'm in the schools, keeping my presence known. Has the GOP been complicit in this, either through silence or through active support for these candidates? To your question, yes. I would hope that I would get a call from the teacher and they would say, one of your sons is having a hard day. I would be horrified. I feel like the trust would be broken between me and the teacher. If the teacher decided on their own account to withhold that from me and coach my son, that's not their job. Their job is to teach my son reading, writing, Writing and math. Their job is not to console my son. That's to let me know so I can coach my son and consult my son. We don't feel that adding more police officers to our schools and makes it more safe. We also see a lot of students right now that are suffering from a lot of mental health issues, but they don't have the mental health professionals on their school campuses to assist them. You said SROs will not make a school safer. It's already too late. The shooter is actively at the school. You've decided to spend only money on mental health counselors instead of SROs. Who makes the school safer? Point of order, we had a phone okay. chair, Uvalde had armed cops outside the building. George Soros and the ADL classified me as one of the most dangerous candidates running for office this year. Anti-defamation league and the, you know, George Soros funny group, they just labeled me as one of the most dangerous candidates running for office. Can you believe? I, I, I think it's a badge of honor because I am a threat to them. So, yeah. Uh, again, this is not G, uh, McCain's GOP is a vastly different GOP that seems to be, you know, focused on culture wars instead of the very important issues facing Arizona, water conservation, housing affordability, um, you know, public education, which 90% of our families rely on. Um, and so uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic, we're going to be hearing an awful lot about that, but not a whole lot of mention about history about the arts, about social emotional learning. They've taken those uh, you know, phrases like social emotional learning and, and use them to divide people. So please stay vigilant when it comes to, especially your local school board candidates and, and what's happening at your local uh, school board meetings and become involved. And again, we're gonna be providing some training on, on how to do that. And civic engagement beyond voting is doing a lot of work with regards to legislative training and being able to use the request to speak uh, system. <laughs> uh, let's see. I mean, and, and, you know, the thing that boggled my mind this time around too is how things are so easily ignored uh, by by so many people who support these right wing candidates. Whether it's you know Herschel Walker and his history of domestic violence and the fact that he did uh, you know pay for abortions for various ex partners whether it's the Rachel Mitchell and the signs that she used to disparage the Gunnigal campaign and specifically her black campaign manager, Bruce Franks Jr., um, Randy Kaufman, and the fact that he was still listed as the preferred candidate of these members of the GOP. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, Marianne Mendoza in LD9, who you know, has several photos of her in blackface, and there was no apology there was no call for these candidates to step down in any of these instances. So, um, you know, rationality and, and pointing out the facts doesn't always work with these people. And I'll share with you very quickly a conversation that I had with uh, somebody who is basically politicking at the Deer Valley uh, Airport on election day. And she had the golden ticket, right? You know, with all of the uh, candidates that she wanted folks to support. Randy Kaufman was still on there, but she had taken it upon herself to black his name out. So that was good. Um, and I just wanted to talk to her to try to figure out, can I find common ground with this woman? Or can I can I make sense of what she seems to think is important? Uh, and so we had a, a conversation about Randy Kaufman and she said, well, he's already stepped down. And I said, well, you know, he 
he suspended his campaign, but he hasn't officially withdrawn. She didn't know that, but she didn't really care about it. She basically said, well, he's not going to win anyway. And he didn't, thank goodness. Uh, we talked a little bit more about, you know, the fact that that here's a guy who's, you know, pleasuring himself in front of a daycare center on a college campus and, um, you know, groomers. And I talked about, you know, the behaviors of her favorite president. Uh, number 45. And she said, no, he's a good, God-fearing, righteous man. And um, those stories aren't true. And I said, despite the fact that he actually said them out loud. And uh, she said, well, that was just locker room talk. I said, okay. And then I said something about um, abortion. And, you know, are you at all concerned about the fact that so many of your candidates don't believe in any kind of exemptions for abortion, including rape and incest. And she said to me that a pregnancy that results in a child is a blessing for anyone, regardless of how it happened. And rape victims should be grateful for that beautiful gift of God that they are getting uh, a child. So these folks don't share like the same reality that we all do. And, but she's showing up. I don't know how many hours she spent at the Deer Valley airport talking to people, but she showed up. And so I guess my question for all of you is, is are you doing the same in what capacity? Um, so again, going back to the point of showing up, some of you may have been paying attention. This was, I think in November, uh, and this was about the 2022 midterm elections. So the elections, I don't think even were tallied up at this point, but this is a little video montage that somebody made and posted on social media. Again, you can see there's Martin Quesada showing up. Um, so I'll just let you go ahead and make of this what you will, but these folks are showing up. Are you? Election needs to be nullified because of the problems. There's no other way to do this but to have another election, to completely scrap this. We need ballots that are paper. It needs to be counted in one day. Why were there ballots were 19 inch in inventory that were probably sent to Republican uh, locations that jammed the machines when he knew that it took 20 inch? Why were the 19 inch ballots in, in inventory? Just disgusted by your behaviors and your decisions that you've made. And look at all these people out here who are just suffering so badly because of your falsehoods, let's just say. And then you look into your own soul and you look back at yourself in the mirror and realize that you are the cancer that is tearing this nation apart. God damn it. Thank you. You have media that's being excluded here. The America Voice and Gateway Pundit has not been allowed to be in here. Why? There are also families who are interested in moving to Arizona and are no longer interested because of this election. The 2020 election was red, but something happened, something unethical, and it seems to be recurring again. Uh, thank you very much. I got fired. And I, when I Thank asked you, I'm why sorry, I your, got fired, your time is up. I was told, I was told I didn't have to have a reason. Ma'am, your time to get is fired. up. Thank you. No, we we are not going to do. We're 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 not going to clap. We're not going to have clapping and cheering. The incompetence of this board is the exact reason why I'm an official candidate to replace Mr. Clint Hickman in District 4 in 2024. No, please stop. Thank you very much. The 17,000 number that has been uh, publicized as door number three ballots is far understated. We were there. We need to stop. I'm watching the clock. We need to stop the outburst. You guys are doing a great job, but let's just keep it the way we are. We can't accept these results. So um, this often happens too at your local school board meetings. I think specifically of places like Chandler and Cave Creek where um, folks are showing up, complaining about kids wearing masks, complaining about school shutdowns. Now they're complaining about CRT, comprehensive sex ed, et cetera, et cetera. And they will continue to show up. So I hope that uh, we can provide you with opportunities to engage 
locally, uh, at the state legislature, et cetera. All right, so what's next? Um, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with folks who work in that lobbying space, uh, at various levels for various organizations. And while we're excited uh, about the fact that we have a governor who will use their veto pen to stop these kinds of discriminatory bills and to stop the expansion of vouchers and things like that, um, we're not optimistic, really, that these folks who were newly elected are actually going to kind of temper their speech or recognize that their bills that they're presenting are likely, you know, constitutional violations, uh, discriminatory in nature, et cetera, et cetera. We all kind of have a feeling that they are going to continue to put forward a lot of these bills and then have the excuse of saying, well, I'm trying to do my job, but the governor won't let me. So we need your voice too uh, at the respect uh, the request to speak system. Um, I will say that I'm glad that in election integrity has been preserved with the election of Adrian Fontes, uh, with Chris Mays at the helm, also with some of these bills, you know, rejecting these requirements for voter IDs, et cetera. Um, I'm optimistic too, the fact that voter registration was almost as high as in 2020. So that means that people are still paying attention. We saw an increase of, of young people, of people of color, of women specifically. Um, so what I hope is that you all engage and really engage with the youth and marginalized communities. You know, we spend an awful lot of time appeasing the middle. And this is my opinion, but we do. Uh, we spend a lot of time appeasing the middle. And I have two children who are in their 20s. And, and they want somebody who speaks to them and the problems that they face, right? The youth of our country don't seem to have the same access to the American dream as many of us Gen Xers or, or boomers had, right? And so we really need to stop appeasing the middle and the moderates and, and really need to start working with the youth and working with people of color to truly engage and have meaningful conversations with them and, and motivate them to want to support more secular and progressive causes. Um, and when the other side moves further to the right, we should not do the same. Um, we also have some of our bluest districts in Arizona that tend to have you know, some of the most moderate elected officials. And so you know, I would love to try to reach out to those moderate Dems and ask you, those of you who live in LD5, 11, 20, or 21, to reach out to your representatives. Oh, IMHO is in my humble opinion. That's what that means, sorry. Um, so in my humble opinion, I think that we really need to stop moving further to the right and, and start leaning in and asking the youth, the people of color, any vulnerable community member, LGBTQ, women, et cetera, to, to really share with us what it is that they need so that we can preserve our secular government. Um, and going back, reach out to those moderate Dems, the ones who we've elected and let them know that we don't want any backpedaling. We don't want religious exemptions. Um, we don't want preferential treatment for religion anywhere near our government. And so I'm asking you all too, if you see something, say something. If you see that there is uh, you know, uh, an invocation happening at your school uh, that you wanna make a statement about or that you wanna provide a secular invocation for, we have a list of secular invocations. If you know that there is a teacher or an administrator at a school or any other government body that you know has a religious, iconography or scripture posted, we need you to say something to us. Diane Post, who's our head of legal and one of our board members, recently um, had a situation with the uh, MVD, the Motor Vehicle Division, and there was an employee there who had scripture at their desk, and the fact that their desk was public-facing made it a problem. If she had a separate office, she can put up anything she wants to. But if I'm in a public setting and I need to see, you know, I have, I'm forced to see your religious iconography, that's a violation. It, it's a violation. And so we need you. If you see something, say something. If you know that there's going to be a vote at your school board meeting, 
we need for you to let us know so that we can do our best to mobilize our members to show up. Um, we did move the needle in some tight districts. And if you live in those districts, I encourage you to become a PC, which means precinct committee person. Support candidates as soon as they announce. And you better believe that you will see candidates announcing their candidacy this month for 2024. Um, oh, thanks. Lindsay put up some resources too for you all to be able to uh, provide any of your um, observe, you know, observations. Um, and again, I, I've been saying this over and over, but engagement really is needed at every level, school board, legislature, cities, counties, because we all saw those people who are showing up on that recording and they will continue to show up and we need to be showing up as well. And, and I want to put this out there too, to stop getting sucked into their wedge issues. Trans rights is a huge wedge issue right now and it's purposeful. It, it distracts us from what we really need to have happen in, in our state and in our country. And we end up arguing about when a, a person should be able to receive you know, these uh, hormone block or puberty blockers and, and hormone treatment and things like that. You know, this is something that's been studied and um, there's science behind it. There's entire organizations who advocate for the support of uh, trans people being able to transition in an appropriate manner. And there's so many different hoops that they have to jump through. It's not as if I could wake up one day and say, you know what, I want to be a man. That's not how this works. And so I encourage you all to leave it up to the experts. Um, limits for abortion. You know, I've had some people talk to me, well, when, when do you draw the line? Not my decision to make. It's between a person and their medical provider. I know that when people uh, terminate a pregnancy, especially a late stage pregnancy, it's often, it's often one of the most difficult decisions that they have, have to make. And it often has to do with the health of the mother or the fact that the pregnancy and, and the birth of that child, that child will not survive outside of the womb. So I don't get sucked into conversations where they ask me, well, at what week do you draw the line? It's not up to me. It's up to a person and their doctor to make that decision. And, and little things too, you know, and I know many of you might have strong feelings about terms like defund the police or whatever. Um, it's not my place to police the world and tell them what language they should use. Um, it's, it's up to me to support the policies behind it. So, you know, and those were some of the strategies that really worked with the GOP this time, you know, uh, talking about people who don't care about women's sports. That's not the case. I care about trans youth or uh, people who are uh, soft on crime. It's not true. I care about the judicial process and making sure that everybody has their fair day at the, you know, in a court of law. So I, I encourage you all to not get sucked into those kinds of conversations. Um, so unfortunately, one of the first pieces of legislature uh, or of legislation that we've seen is SB 1001, uh, sponsored by uh, Senator John Kavanaugh, who's in Legislative District 3, representing Fountain Hills, North Scottsdale, et cetera. And of course, it has to do with pronouns. It has to do uh, with kids, trans kids in schools, being able to use the, uh, the pronouns that they want and basically providing a religious exemption for anybody who doesn't agree with it because it goes against their religion. Um, I recently had a, a little write-up in a new publication by my friend Joseph Joffrey, who is a reporter for the Arizona Republic. It's called The Lookout. It's an LGBTQ publication that is specifically about um, uh, laws and policies affecting the LGBTQ community. He's on Substack. I encourage you to subscribe to it. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, this isn't about religious freedom. This is about state sanctioned discrimination. And we need to stand up to it every single time that we see it. Um, I also shared with Lindsay a list of the House and Senate leadership. So hopefully she'll put that up. But, uh, and I don't have it all committed to memory or anything like that, but I can tell you a few of these appointments are really alarming. Senator Wendy Rogers is now the chair for the Senate Elections Committee. Think about that for a second. Um, let's see, Matt Gress is the chair in the House for the Education Committee. committee. 
Um, so the the people who are, are are now in charge of hearing the voices of all of you, uh, in many cases, are people who are extremists, and we need you to show up. Um, we still have the 15 week abortion ban in place. There is another case that just came out of South Carolina that's a bit inspiring because they struck down the abortion ban that was in place in South Carolina, the Supreme Court did, and they did it because of the privacy clause that is on their state constitution. Arizona has that same privacy. Uh, it's I can't remember the article. If Diane was here, she'd be able to just spout it right off. But the fact that that case is relying on that privacy clause in their constitution to strike down the abortion ban in South Carolina is something that I'll be watching very closely. Um, Hobbs first uh, executive order has to do with anti-discrimination laws in um, government agencies and municipalities. We're still not hearing anything about the AEL, the aggregate expenditure limit. Uh, there's no mention so far of 1980 spending cap being repealed. Um, and the other thing that's going on, there's absolute turmoil in the GOP. This week has put it on full display. It's happening here in Arizona too. Uh, TPUSA, Turning Point USA, Charlie Kirk's organization, which is based in Scottsdale, has essentially taken over the GOP. And there's a few articles uh, in the Republic that have uh, kind of given that a timeline. So you all can see how the GOP is really fracturing. It's fragmented. And hopefully it's an opportunity for all of us. And again, we're a nonpartisan organization, but when we're talking about which side of the aisle supports secular government and supports the separation of church and state, unfortunately, it tends to only be one side. Um, and when you have nonpartisan groups like uh, Turning Point USA seriously trying to influence and uh, uh, elections and, and legislation, we all need to be paying attention and, and hopefully they're, they're not self-aware enough to see that they seem to be kind of just destroying themselves from the inside. And I think that is the end of my presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. I'm gonna go ahead and get back into the chat. Looks like most of the chat is, thank you so much, Lindsay. Are we able to save the chat for the links being posted? Can't copy them. Oof. Um, I don't know if we can do that, if there's a way to do that, Lindsay. If there is, please do. But I have noticed that with um, Zoom, that you can't copy and paste from the chat. Perhaps what you can do is click on those links, keep the windows open, and, and save them for later. Let's see what it says here. Post on the website. Perfect. So they'll be posted on the website. And we can probably go back. We'll have a recording of this. We can go back and post some of these links to our Facebook Live or even post them as comments on our YouTube channel. For people who want to, uh, you can take a photo of it as well. But boy, that's a lot of that's a lot to type in. But I think Lindsay's going to take care of it and get it on the blog so that we can have all of that in one convenient space for everybody. It's one on one. So I just want to check real quick and see if anybody does have any questions uh, at all before I let you all enjoy. Yeah, check back this weekend on the blog. And we'll have those links posted for all of you. Oh, somebody's no, nobody ever rings my doorbell. I think that's the I think that's the perfect opportunity for me to be able to go ahead and let everybody go today. Wasn't quite as depressing as it has been the past few months. Please support Secular AZ so that we can support um, the the side of right and the separation of church and state. And with that, my dog and whoever's knocking on the door, we're going to let you go ahead and go. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care.